Good morning, everyone. I now declare this meeting of Heritage Oakville open. And uh, this meeting is also live streamed. So there may be people at home who are watching it. And if they wish to get a copy of the agenda from which we're all working, they can go on to oakville.ca and find under the heading of council and meetings, they'll be able to get hold of the agenda. Um, we have uh, delegations for the meeting, but I think they're all in person. Any delegations that wanted to attend um, virtually would have had to register by noon yesterday. Um, we will de have delegations from the floor and people in the, in, the, in, in the audience today are able to speak to the meetings at the proper time to the items. Okay, we have three registered delegations today and uh, we have um, three discussion items and an information item. And it's interesting that with two of our committee members who are attending virtually, I can see Brenda Sweeney on my screen and Brenda is um, in Finland today. So it's about half past four, I guess, where she is. And uh, Jason has, has now appeared on our screen. So we're able to see you this time, guys, so that it's not like last time where I, I, I didn't know whether you wanted to speak or not, and we had to interrupt the proceedings to find that out. So if you can wave or otherwise uh, make a lot of <laughs> poking, which is, you're, you're showing me your ring there. Is that, <laughs> Brenda, I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, uh, anyway, okay, so we're all here. Do we have any regrets, uh, Madam Secretary? We do, Carrie Colburn. Yep, okay, thank you. Do we have any declarations of pecuniary interest with respect to any item before the committee today? No? Good. Um, the next item on the agenda is the confirmation of the minutes of the last meeting. And these minutes were circulated. Are there any comments? Would somebody give me a motion to approve? Thank you, Councillor Duddock. Uh, the motion is that we approve the minutes. Any further discussion? Anyone opposed to that motion? Oh, the minutes are approved. So when I move into the discussion items, and at this point I'll remind everybody that we are an advisory committee and that any recommendations that we make will go to the Planning and Development Council at its meeting on Monday, September the 11th at 6.30 p.m., when our recommendations will be dealt with, and anyone who wishes to delegate at that meeting with respect to any of these items should let the clerk know well in advance of the meeting. So, our first item of business is item 4.1, which is a repeal of a designation bylaw, and that seems to be Sue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll just get the presentation pulled up on the screen for item 4.1, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so this will actually be able, I think, a, a fairly quick presentation to you today. I'm just here to take you through what's mostly a procedural application, which is a, uh, to repeal a heritage designation bylaw. Normally, this is a slightly more um, complicated process. However, there are some extenuating circumstances to this particular uh, property that I will just like quickly touch on. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Church of the Epiphany site, it is located on the east side of Brawny Road, just north of Lakeshore Road West in Brawny Village. Um, and so what we're looking at today is a request to repeal bylaw 1994-175. So this bylaw was passed in 1994 to conserve the cultural heritage value of the old Church of the Epiphany, which was located at 141 Brawny Road. However, that structure no longer exists. In um, 2002, Oakville Town Council approved uh, the demolition request for uh, that old church of the Epiphany due to its structural condition. Um, I wasn't, wasn't on the um, 
wasn't with the town at that time. I'm sure most of us here weren't involved in that application, um, but the meeting notes certainly do uh, recognize that unfortunately um, the structure was uh, unsalvageable due to its poor condition. However, the designation bylaw for the property was not repealed at that time because it is actually a separate process from the act of demolition under the Ontario Heritage Act. And so the Anglican diocese, who are the owners of the Church of the Epiphany, have now formally applied to repeal the designation bylaw. And because the reasons for designation no longer actually exist, uh, as stated in the designation bylaw, heritage planning staff do not object to this application to repeal bylaw 1994-175. So just to uh, show you what's there on the site right now, uh, we have a very modern structure, obviously constructed after 2002, um, which is still used by the congregation of the Church of the Epiphany. And you can see there a photograph of what the old church uh, used to look like. But it, however, is long gone. The only remnants of the church that remain are the church bell, which are stored inside the new Church of the Epiphany. And there is a memorial garden that's actually located at one side of the building as well. Um, and so staff recommendation before you today is that the bylaw to designate 141 Brawny Road uh, be repealed. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Well, I was there at the time. And uh, the, the present brick church, though, was built way back. It was certainly there in the 70s. Okay. And the old church was a wooden church. The Wilson Hall, I think it was called. It was used as a church hall, and it was a wooden structure. And I believe there was fire damage. And they had done their best to maintain the integrity of the building even after the fire. Uh, but it got to the point where, where maintenance was just simply not worth it. And it was no longer used as the place of worship. Um, so I guess this is dealing with the, 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 the final step in this process because the whole site would have been designated and the structure which was the cause of the designation now no longer exists. So it seems pointless to have a part four designation on a site uh, which has already got a structure on it, which is not of heritage value particularly. Anyway, I was there at that time. Um, so any questions of, of Sue on that? Okay, no. Anyone else wish to speak on this? No, okay. So confined to the board. Would somebody want to give me a motion? Okay, Brent, sorry, Sue. Sue, good, thanks. Sue has given us the motion that the staff recommendation be accepted. Any further discussion on that? Anyone opposed to that motion? The motion is carried, thank you. Okay, next item. This is the regular uh, business now of our meeting. We have uh, multiple properties uh, proposed for designation under part four. And this is uh, uh, Carolyn uh, going to walk us through this. Carolyn? There we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chair. We do have six more designations this month. Uh, you can see the, the six property addresses there below, and I'll just take you through each of them pretty briefly. You obviously all have the six uh, share, the research reports uh, in your agenda. So the first is the Grace Ivy House at 255 Douglas Avenue. Uh, it's located within the Brantwood subdivision at the corner of Douglas and Shedden. And through the assessment, we determined that it is worthy of heritage uh, designation under the Ontario Heritage Act, firstly for its design physical value as a representative example of an Ad Ontario Edwardian classicism style home with period revival influences. And historically, it is associated with the theme of development of Br the Brantwood subdivision and with Albert Frederick Ford, who was an important local builder. He designed and constructed uh, several homes in Brantwood in the arts and crafts style. And then finally, contextually, it's considered an important part of uh, the defining and supporting and maintaining the historic residential character of Brantwood and is uh, really linked to its sur surroundings being the Brantwood neighborhood. So I'll move to the second one, which is the Irving House, again located in the same neighborhood at Douglas and McDonald. It's a representative example of an arts and crafts uh, influenced home with Queen Anne and Tudor revival influences. 
historically associated again with the area uh, known as Brantwood and with Albert Frederick Ford, the important local builder within the neighborhood. And again, contextually is important in supporting and maintaining the residential character of Brantwood. Thirdly, we have the Peak House located on Douglas Avenue between Spruce and McDonald at 383 Douglas Avenue. Again, it is a representative example of an arts and crafts era house, this time with Craftsman and Tudor Revival uh, architectural and design elements. It's historically associated with the development of Brantwood and contextually has importance in supporting and maintaining the historic residential character of Brantwood. And then we move to the next one. This is outside of the Brantwood uh, subdivision, obviously. This is in what we call North Oakville at 3444 Trafalgar Road, known as the Bentley Family Farmhouse. And uh, it's considered to have a design value as a representative of an early example of a 19th century Ontario Gothic revival style house. It's associated with early settler families and with the theme of agricultural development of Trafalgar Township. Um, and these settler families include the Bentley family who owned the property for over a century. And it also has potential to yield information that contributes to the understanding of early European settlers and the development of their residential structures. And that's in looking at um, how the building was built with the rear portion that is uh, potentially older than the front portion of the house. And finally, contextually, it is physically, visually, and historically linked to its surroundings and is considered to be a highly visible landmark within the local uh, area that still today remains uh, rural, but of course will be developed in the future. The next one, we are back to Brantwood. Uh, this is 307 Watson Avenue, known as the Stock House, located at the corner of Galt and Watson. It is a representative example of a craftsman house, a design and construction, and again, associated with the development of Brantwood. This one is also associated with Sidney Frederick Whiffen, who was another local builder who constructed homes in the arts and crafts style, along with Ford, the other builder we had mentioned earlier. And contextually is important in supporting and maintaining the historic character of Brantwood. And then finally, we have the Slater House at 340 Watson, uh, located between Galt and McDonald on Watson Avenue. It's a representative example of a colonial revival style house built in the 1930s. Again, it's associated with the theme of development of Brantwood and is important in maintaining the historic residential character of this historic neighborhood. So the staff recommendation is that these six properties um, be designated. So the notice of intention to designate be issued under section 29 part four of the Heritage Act for all six of these. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, now in your package, you've got the full details with respect to the, the, the reasons for, for designation on each of these properties. What you've just had today is just a highlight of that, which is all, all we really want for the presentation. So thank you for that, Carolyn. Uh, Mrs. Ivy gets around. She owned our house in the 1930s. And in fact, she built the sunroom which is on the south side of the house at that time. And she also installed the new and improved hot water heating system, engaging the services of George H. Barrett and Sons. Uh, you'll know that firm because our late beloved mayor, Harry Barrett, <laughs> that, that was his father and Harry took over the business. So she, she was in our house, I think until the early forties, she sold it to Isabel Eaton at that time. So she gets around. Okay, any questions of, of Carolyn with respect to anything that she's presented? Council Duddick. Thank you. Um, I guess my concern relates to item number four, and I was just madly going through some of the um, information that you provided. Um, is it currently under the ownership of someone who intends to develop the property, do you know, or is it still just privately owned? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor, yes, it, I think it's the idea is it to be developed. It is owned by, um, I think, the organ company that's going to be developing it. I can also um, defer that to the uh, delegates as well. They might have that's more information. But, but it is not no longer privately owned by a family, I don't think, no. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Right. Is there anyone um, in the audience who wishes to speak with respect to any of those items? You, sir? 
if you would come up to the microphone and give your name, rank, and serial number for the benefit of the secretary. And the secretary will start the clock. I think you can do that, can you, Natasha? Is this on? It, it's yes. showing 10, but you've got a 10 minute countdown. And yep. if she starts the clock, it starts to count down. But can you do that, Natasha? If you can't, I'll do it on my phone. You can't, okay. So what we'll do is, we're not gonna, we're not really all that formal, but we really yep. do have to follow the procedures. Yep. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll start my clock. And uh, when you've got a minute left, <laughs> I'll, I'll I, let you know. I don't expect okay? to be that long, okay. uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so name and yep. see. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Vincent Santamora, Principal Architect of Vincent J. Santamora Architect, Inc., 23 Parnell Crescent, uh, Ontario, L1R2L4. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, staff, and interested public, I'm, I'm a registered architect that's been active in designing buildings and communities in the greater Toronto region for over 35 years. I'm also a certified heritage professional accredited with the Canadian Association of Heritage Professor Professionals. I've been working in heritage buildings and heritage districts across the GTA for the last 20 years or so. I was requested by the property owner, DGB Trafalgar Limited, to review the notice of intention to designate recommendation report prepared by town staff before you today with respect to the property at 3444 Trafalgar Road, known as the Bentley House to see if the information collected and the heritage assessment conducted by town staff met the criteria under the Ontario Heritage Act to permit designation of that property under the Act. I summarized my review in my letter to the committee dated August 21st, 2023, which I'm sure you've had a copy, and I will briefly uh, review it today for the committee. The documentation of the property prepared by town staff was quite complete and presented a good base from which to conduct a heritage assessment using the criteria in the regulations of the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, with respect to its design and or physical heritage value, the building is a circa 1840s and later farmhouse built in a simplified Gothic revival or Ontario farmhouse style as we know and love in our, in our province. However, as an example of the style, the building is missing certain key elements, uh, such as a porch and, and extensive uh, exterior decoration. And the projecting central bay is more of a neoclassical element than uh, architectural Gothic. As well, you've noticed the second story window, which is typical for this style, is actually a triangular shaped transom instead of the more uh, accurately pointed uh, arched window. So it's not, it's, it's not a good representative uh, example of the style. The construction technique is of, of, of the home is of interest. The stacked limestone infill walling technique is, is an uncommon building technique, though examples can be found of this construction method in communities near water courses. And given the use of the diamond-shaped mesh in the uh, application of the stucco finishing coat. This current application of the stucco is not original. The construction technique, as uh, staff alluded to, has many joints because of the stacking of flat stones and a rigid stucco covering to cover it to keep it in place. This will present uh, quite a, a, a structural challenge uh, should the building be required to be moved, making it impractical and, and costly as well. The, found, the building exterior walls are attached directly to the foundation, which creates an integral structure and thereby moving it, unlike say a frame building, which, uh, or even a brick building that has a separation between the ground floor and the foundation, uh, makes it more easy to insert uh, steel beams, help raise the building and movement. Uh, this particular construction technique makes the lifting of the building very challenging and given the amount of joints and the rigidness of the stuc stucco, there's going to be a lot of cracking and motion of the structure uh, should it be moved. So, so moving it's uh, probably an impractical option and they're uh, thereby expensive. So uh, of the first three criteria, which we're all familiar with for heritage assessment, I would say the building meets the first for its uncommon construction technique, but not for architectural style as a representative sample of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Gothic revival. 
With respect to the historical and or associative value, the connection to the earlier settlers of, of the land is, uh, of the property is tenuous. As noted in the report, the Kenny family did not live on the property and neither did uh, Colonel Peter Adamson, who held the property as a, a minor part of his large land holdings in the county. In the early days of, of Upper Canada, property ownership was also quite speculative uh, as, as it is today. And so I would suggest that there are more appropriate locations to commemorate the above, the above persons than this property, uh, either uh, where the Colonel lived or where the Adamsons lived uh, in town. While the Bentley family lived and worked the property for over three generations, they were no doubt good, hardworking, faithful, family-oriented people, part of the many who built this country. And, uh, but their activities did not rise above the typical level of involvement in the community that would meet the, the second three criteria for designation. I do not wish to judge the family's life and hard work, their contributions to their community. I mean, you know, they were part of the many that helped build this country um, in those early days, but I don't think they rose above to uh, the significant level that's required under the Heritage Act to warrant designation. Uh, so in, in, in this review of these three sections, the criteria for historical and associative heritage have not been met. With respect to the contextual heritage value, the building sits back from Trafalgar Road without any supporting outbuildings or indication of a tree-lined windbreak, which was typical for the time. The building itself has no eye-catching elements which would draw attention to it as you pass by and make it a landmark. And uh, any con I would think that any contextual heritage value has been lost. So the final three criteria for heritage assessment have not been met. So in conclusion, it's my opinion that the heritage value of this property is low and the minimum two of nine criteria for designation under the Ontario Act have not been met. Even when you compare them to the current slate of candidates properties uh, before the committee today, this particular property pales in comparison. In closing, I'd like to remind the committee and through to council of the necessity to balance the needs of property owners with the public good. And that only the best examples of our local history should be found and commemorated. In this particular property, it has not been achieved. I respectfully request that the property at 3444 Trafalgar Road be excluded from the notice of intention to designate and removed from the heritage inventory as it does not meet the criteria for designation. I just would like to add that while the property does not meet criteria for designation, some commemoration and celebration of the property's history could be undertaken by the naming of streets, parks, and schools uh, of the family names associated with the property. I encourage the committee to direct staff to start the process to add the Adamson, Kenny, and Bentley names to the town's list of approved street names so that those names are approved in coming forward um, for when the property is uh, developed. And uh, with that, I thank you for your consideration in this matter, and I'm available for questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Santamora, and you had two full minutes left, so thank you for staying well within your, 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 your time limit. Thank you. Um, and, and I should just tell you that this committee can't direct anybody to do anything, but I'm sure people on council here I have will heard say what you recommend. said. I will say recommend. Yeah, or even, yeah, but the, the council, I'm sure, would have heard what you've said about adding those, those names. Uh, so any, any questions of the delegation? Councillor Duddock. Thank you, three of you, you um, Mr. Chair. Um, not wanting to be argumentative, um, I do have a problem when someone speaks to the designation of a property and their focus is on how it can be moved. Um, we have to be focused on the um, heritage merits or historical merits of designation not on how a developer may or may not want to move the property and the impact that may have on us deciding whether or not to designate. So um, respectfully, we agree to disagree. If I may respond, Mr. Chair, there is guidance under the Provincial uh, Heritage Act about the uh, structural uh, consideration of the structure of properties. A full heritage impact assessment, if it were done 
if it were to come in under uh, a, a request for permit for demolition or incorporation into a site. I mean, as you know, we look at keeping the building in situ, uh, preserving it, conserving it, moving it on site if we can, moving it off site, and you know, even, even I do not like to ask for demolition, but there are cases where it's warranted. Um, and the provincial guidance on, under a heritage impact assessment would sort of add this to the mix as we're considering the heritage impact. Now, this process is, is a slightly different, you're correct, because it's coming forward from, uh, from the town as opposed to the property owner. And so this is more of a cultural heritage evaluation report. So, you know, yes, I, uh, I agree that perhaps structural considerations for the building may not be warranted as we have not explored alternative uh, answers and options for the property. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to staff, um, we often have various opinions ex expressed uh, in instances such as this. Uh, in this case, we have one out of nine, and the uh, our delegation this morning has eight out of nine in terms of not in their opinion, not in their professional opinion, meaning that. Could you just, without going through point by point, could you just give us a quick over, an overview in terms of where we differ? Sure, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Um, so I think the first one was you know, talking about it being a representative example of the Gothic revival style. Um, and, and there are some elements like the front porch, which was common, but not always used. We haven't seen a front porch on this for many years in recent memory. We have no photos of it. Could have been there, likely was there at some point. Um, but for us, there's still enough of it there. Um, and I think the other thing we, we mentioned was it's an early example. It is, if it you know, really was built in 1840s, as all of our evidence suggests, um, it is one of the earliest buildings we have remaining in North Oakville, so that's another portion of that first criteria, which is to say it's an early example uh, of that style. So that's another reason we picked that out. And moving into historical socio value, again, you know, the Bentley family, when we're looking at that, it's as significant to a community. In our mind, we still think that that theme of development, of agricultural development, uh, and with the early settlers like the Bentley family, in our mind is enough, is significant to a community. I mean, they may not be well known within the province or, you know, like far beyond the reaches of Oakville or Trafalgar Township, but from enough of our research, we found that they were, um, you know, well known farming families within the community, and at that time, being on that site for over, for about a century, that they did have, um, you know, a significant role to play in that rural community in Trafalgar Township. And the second piece with the um, historical socio value is, this is a bit of um, information we're trying to capture an opportunity to look at the rear portion of this house because multiple times when we've designated houses in the past and it comes to the restoration, we have found that the rear portion of the house is actually older, not always, um, but we've found that they are actually early 1800s, um, as early as 1812, 1815. And so we want to be able to capture that to be able to um, determine if that rear portion uh, perhaps is of that vintage. If that changed down the road through you know, through more assessment, we would remove that from any future designation bylaw if needed. Um, and then finally, contextually, for us, I mean, I know these, these areas will change and the property has changed. It's no longer a homestead. And we're not looking at it as a cultural heritage landscape. We're looking at it as an individual building. But for us, it still has that contextual value because it is a remnant of this agricultural landscape. And while this area is going to be changing uh, into residential um, development, mostly in this area, and we want to be able to keep against sort of these anchor points, these remnants, these pieces of history that are really important to still define that area in terms of its history and its contribution to the agricultural development of Trafalgar Township, which of course also led to um, changes and, and sort of built the community of Oakville that it is today. So that's what we were looking at um, contextually. And I think just to answer your question, the Heritage Act is subjective. 
everyone can kind of look at it and come away with it, something that's a little bit different. Um, unfortunately, it isn't black and white. It's not oranges to oranges, apples to apples, that sort of thing. So there's always room for discussion. Um, I think from our perspective, this is a building we've been looking at as a, a heritage property that should be conserved since 2007. Uh, we'd worked with the owners over the years to make sure it's conserved and they've done a great job of making sure it's boarded up um, and properly uh, just maintained and secured. So this is a property we've always looked at as a having really strong potential for designation and as one of the remaining buildings within North Oakville that we need to keep to conserve that agricultural history. But again, it's, it is common to have different views on certain ones, but in our perspective, there's enough here that is worth designation. Thank you. I, I appreciate the further explanation. And uh, Mr. Chair, at the appropriate time, I'd be happy to include that in the movement for us. And uh, we are recommending uh, the committee and have that uh, move forward to council. If I Thank may you. respond um, a little bit. Normally, delegations, we don't do back and forth. So we're not able to really do that. I'm sorry. Um, it, At Whitby, we do. Just like you've got, I sit on the local board there and we do have a banter, but that's okay. Yeah, but I should remind you that whatever the outcome is today, I mean, if you're happy with the outcome today, fine. But if you're not happy with the outcome today, council meets on September the 11th. Under the same general rules, you get 10 minutes. Yep. Um, staff can be asked to clarify, but we don't get into a back and forth debate. So I'm, I'm sorry. I, right. Okay, thank you very thank much you, for Mr. your Chairman, dedication, sir. Members of the committee. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to this item? Nope, okay, so we're confined to the board. So we have a list of, of one through six, and we have one where a, a delegation has presented us with an alternative view um, of, of the staff uh, report. Um, so I'm in the hands of the committee. Uh, Jerry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the um, comment and the opinion of Mr. Santamora, but as uh, Councillor Giddings and Carolyn uh, indicated, there are always different opinions. You can always have different opinions on the same topic. I think um, Mr. Santamora is looking at, from what I can see and what I heard, Mr. Santamora is looking at this project from a macro scale, from a broader national perspective and I think this report reflects what our mandate on this committee is and that is our local art architectural history heritage Oakville and from that perspective um, I'm very much in favor and supportive of what we see before us um, put together by staff um, it depends on the spectrum to which you apply the, the comment and opinion and I think this is very much a local Oakville um, perspective and evaluation. Um, and I think it's a great idea uh, that um, there is a willingness to use the historical content for branding and naming of streets in the new development. I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, and uh, thirdly, for the restoration of this building, although it looks as though it could be an onerous task, there have been uh, wonderful and successful examples of restoration and, and integration into new developments and communities um, of buildings that have looked even uh, less uh, stable or less, um, you know, of a deter deteriorated state. So overall, I would I would support the staff um, proposal and evaluation in this case. But thank you for for that uh, different opinion, Mr. Santamara. Thank you, Jerry, very helpful. Any, any other comments? So is somebody prepared to give me a motion? Councillor Gittings, so your motion is that the staff recommendation uh, be adopted. That is the motion. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Is there anyone opposed to that motion? Seeing none, the motion is carried. Thank you very much, everybody. So the next item on the agenda is item 4.3, which is the old Oakville Heritage Conservation District update. And this is the draft study, uh, which I know has been worked on for quite some time by a lot of very diligent, hardworking people. Um, so Sue is gonna kick us off with this. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I thank you to the members of the committee for taking the time to read through this uh, relatively lengthy report, um, and also to the members of the community who did so as well in preparation uh, for this meeting. Um, I know it's an awful lot of information. Um, it certainly represents quite a lot of hard work uh, on um, behalf of quite a few people uh, and interests. And I'm pleased to be here today to take you through some of the highlights of the draft study that we've prepared for you. Um, uh, the study, uh, sorry, the, the committee has been kept informed about the progress of the update to the Old Oakville Heritage Conservation District um, over the past couple of years. As everyone knows, this is our oldest heritage conservation district. The original uh, town bylaw was passed in 1981 and then endorsed by the Ontario Municipal Board in 1982, and it hasn't been updated since that time. And so um, this has been a very uh, a significant project for us to uh, undertake the updating of uh, this uh, Heritage Conservation District. And as we know, the Ontario Heritage, Heritage Act requires that first we complete a study and then we complete a plan and guidelines in order to actually have a heritage conservation district in place under um, current heritage legislation. So uh, as I mentioned, we've been working on this for quite a while. Um, we had a kickoff meeting virtually um, online in fall of 2021 back in um, uh, COVID times really uh, to kind of introduce people to the concept of what we were uh, planning on doing for the project. We undertook uh, an, uh, a request for proposals, an RFP, uh, and went through a process to retain our consulting team um, throughout kind of the early winter and then into the spring of 2022. Um, our consultants are um, ARA, working in consultation with Dylan and uh, GD Valley. Um, and once we had those uh, fine consultants on board, we began a consultation with our stakeholders, um, including the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association, the Historical Society, uh, the two churches in the area, um, and the Oakville Club, in addition to the residents. Uh, we held our first public meeting, which was an update just on the, what we were doing in uh, December of 2022, and it was wonderful to have that as an in-person meeting. Um, and we took a lot of feedback from that public meeting about, uh, you know, what people were thinking of uh, for uh, inclusion in the draft study. Um, uh, and we took all of that into consideration as the consultants worked on producing the first draft in conjunction with town staff who provided quite a bit of material as well. And so that was released, I believe, at the end of March in 2023. So that's just earlier this year. And then we held a public meeting um, to go through that draft study uh, that was held at the Oakville Public Library. A number of the committee members uh, attended and it was well attended too by um, the public and people who were interested in sharing their thoughts and information and hearing more about um, the draft study. And so since that time, um, staff have been engaged uh, in some very intense uh, review of all of the inventory sheets that show up in um, the appendices of the district study uh, with the help of the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association and Oakville Historical Society. So that's what we've been doing up until now. So the, the draft study that you see before you today um, includes a lot of a lot of work. Um, it includes a much more detailed history of the Heritage Conservation District area, uh, including a lot of pre-contact. So that means looking at First Nations history, um, as well as the European settlement and development of this particular area of Oakville. There's a very thorough analysis of the built heritage character of the properties in the district. And I'll go through some of this in a little bit more detail uh, later in the presentation. Um, the consultants have also provided some very um, detailed descriptions of the existing streetscape and the landscape context that we have right now, um, as well as looking at the land use character and a very thorough policy review. Uh, the district plan uh, study notes that there are cultural heritage landscapes uh, within the Heritage Conservation District, so both the Erkless Estate and the Oakville Harbour, which have been recognized 
um, separately through part four, heritage designation bylaws. And then uh, they've included some recommended objectives for the update um, and what we should be looking at in uh, the next step, which is the plan and its content, as well as some recommended changes to our municipal processes and bylaws. Um, and then additional uh, plan content that includes a statement of intent, the objectives of the proposed designation, and all of this is kind of being done in conjunction with the greater kind of plan of public engagement in our discussions with the Residents Association, uh, Oakville Historical Society, other stakeholders as well. So I'm gonna uh, just take you through a few of the maps because I think some of the analysis that's been provided in this district study um, you know, is, is an absolutely fabulous tool that we didn't have access to uh, previously. Um, the consultants have been fantastic at, uh, at mapping the data and providing visual representations of what you see on the ground there. And so um, what we have here right now is the period of development map um, that we're looking at that correspond to some of the historic sections and write-ups in the district study itself. You'll note that there really isn't um, any uh, indigenous uh, development noted on this map largely because their associations now are kind of historic in nature rather than um, uh, represented through any physical uh, landmarks other than the waterways themselves. Um, but you can see by the the amount of purple on this map uh, that the, the majority of this heritage district was developed prior to 1900. Um, and then a, a significant section comes between 1900 and 1930 with little bits of infill happening and a slower period between 1930 and 1970. And then since 1970, the redevelopment that has happened, um, some of it before the Heritage District Plan was in place, uh, but quite a bit of it afterwards as well. Um, here we have a much more colorful map that represents the architectural styles that are shown in the Heritage Conservation District. All of these styles themselves are defined within the draft study, um, uh, including pictorial representations uh, because a picture is always worth a thousand words so you can see what we're talking about when we mean, you know, arts and crafts, Cape Cod revival, neoclassical, etc. Um, and so there's really a wide variety of architectural styles in the Heritage Conservation District, which combine to make it such a unique and special place. Um, th this is just one of the maps that gets into some of the real nitty gritty details of what you see in the Old Oakville area. So this is actually a height map of the, the number of stories um, on the existing structures within the Heritage Conservation District. There are a number of other maps that talk, uh, that sorry, that show uh, uh, roof styles, cladding materials, uh, fencing typologies. And I haven't included them all in this presentation. They're certainly there for you to look at in the district study, but they have been, um, the information contained in these maps has been used by our consultants in their analysis to come up with the uh, landscape character areas. And so the landscape character areas are what we are proposing to replace the previous system in the 1981 Heritage District Plan, which was divided into blocks. And so on this screen, I've got a helpful, handy side-by-side -side comparison of what we uh, were working with earlier with the block system and what is now being proposed in the draft study before you today. So. The Heritage District Plan from 1981, I think, has served us very well. However, one of the problems that staff has experienced over the past few years has been trying to pull the information included in the block descriptions into the guidelines because they were included in separate sections in that plan. The information in those blocks, uh, block analysis is um, analysis? Uh, were very helpful though. And so we wanted to make sure that we weren't losing that information as we moved forward with a new draft study. Um, however, we wanted to make sure that the information uh, would be um, analyzed and sorted in a way that would be very applicable to us, uh, especially for us to use as we move forward into the new plan and guidelines. And six areas uh, is quite a bit more manageable than the previous 18 areas. Um, 
and we've taken a lot of time to go through uh, the, the, the new proposed uh, character areas uh, with our, um, our stakeholders. And uh, we've made a number of changes from that first draft to what you can see here. Um, and I know we're going to continue to have discussions about that uh, hopefully today. So I'm just going to quickly touch on these six character areas. Um, essentially, area one is covering uh, what we see largely as the, the public spaces of the Heritage District, uh, although I would note certainly that the Oakville Club is not a public space, it is a, a privately owned club, but it, it um, forms part of that kind of open space and park-like atmosphere. Um, uh, and uh, we've got a lot of uh, the shoreline represented in this particular area as well. And so what the district's uh, study has done in this section has provided a description based largely on the landscape and the streetscape. So we're looking really at the urban fabric in the physical, um, uh, physical elements that exist in these particular areas so that we can come up with uh, considerations to be carried into the planning guidelines as we move forward. And so that's why each one of these character area descriptions concludes, uh, I guess it doesn't conclude with because we do have a list of the addresses, but it, uh, one of the key components is this guideline considerations for the updated plan to include. And I think that's really important so this information doesn't get lost um, and we can make sure that it's being carried into the plan and guidelines so that there can be specific guidelines um, directed towards these landscape character areas if we feel that they're necessary. And so for uh, the guideline considerations for area one, we'd be looking at protection of the access, um, uh, enjoyment, physical, visual connectivity of the public lands um, for these recreational activities, as well as their connections with indigenous significance. Um, and our uh, two CHLs are also within these areas um, and the natural heritage functions along the lakeshore. So area two is this small area um, that's uh, kind of this orangey color. And so you'll notice on the maps in front of you, I have highlighted the areas that I'm talking about in each slide with a little red border. Um, and so it's a small area, but it really packs a punch because this is one of the, I'd say the most walked streetscapes in Old Oakville, um, that, that walk down Navy Street towards Lakeside Park. And so uh, the key considerations we're looking at for this particular area are protection of the physical and visual connectivity of these residential properties to the open spaces um, that surround them. We're looking at Navy Street and that small section of Front Street that's quite narrow right along uh, Lakeside Park as these key streetscapes that, again, look into these open spaces and provide visual and physical access to uh, the lakefront. Area three is really centered around St. Jude's Anglican Church. Um, it's because of its uh, size and significance and height in the area. Um, there are view lines that are important uh, in this particular area to be protected, as well as obviously the urban fabric of the streetscape um, and the tree canopy and vegetation that make these leafy tree-lined streets uh, so lovely to experience. Area four um, actually reflects uh, some of the uh, changes in topography in the Heritage Conservation District. And so it's really designed to acknowledge that there is this gully system that runs down um, uh, George Street and also kind of along Front Street and, and uh, surrounding streets sloping um, towards uh, kind of its terminus at the George Street Parkette. And so because there's such a change in grades in some of these areas, what we'll need to be looking at for the guidelines and the updated plan are protection of these um, vertical and horizontal gully planes, which make uh, dealing with height and massing along these streetscapes kind of tricky. And we've certainly experienced that over the past few years. 
as we've looked at redevelopments of properties, uh, especially along Front Street. And so we know that that's something that's significant and important to the community, and we feel that it's something that can be carried over um, from this study into the planning guidelines. Area five, um, this large yellow area, really reflects a very interesting mix of architectural styles um, that come along with the, the consultants have defined as a traditional town road typology, which is two lanes of traffic uh, with sidewalks on either one or both sides of the road. Um, and there are varying setbacks, varying lot sizes, varying fencing typologies, but really um, this area, despite the, the, the differences between each property, has a very lovely open uh, character. And so that's one of the things that we'll be looking at as carrying over as a key guideline is protection of these varied architectural styles, the setbacks, lot sizes, and again, those lovely tree-lined streets. And so area six is the last area that the consultants have included in their landscape uh, character proposal. Um, and this is centered around uh, St. Andrew's Catholic Church. Uh, again, being one of the taller buildings in the Heritage Conservation District, um, and actually having a kind of a, its own little um, collection of, of properties. So it's not just the church, um, there are a number of buildings in this area that are directly and historically associated with uh, St. Andrews. And so uh, this area really uh, is about protecting uh, the urban fabric surrounding St. Andrews. Again, our tree canopy and our vegetation and these views to the St. Andrews complex. One of the new considerations uh, under the Ontario Heritage Act changes that have been made more recently uh, require that heritage conservation districts meet a minimum threshold of 25% of the properties uh, meeting at least two of the criteria of Ontario Regulation 906. We're obviously very familiar with those criteria. And so if you've taken a look through the inventory sheets, we have actually assigned uh, criteria to each one of those properties. And so what you see here in this map is a visual representation of the properties that meet uh, uh, more than one criteria um, and the properties that meet, uh, that do not meet those criteria. In terms of meeting two criteria, there are 90 of the approximately 120 or so properties in this Heritage Conservation District, which means that 70% of the Heritage Conservation District meets the new criteria for having uh, two of the criteria points met uh, under the Ontario Heritage Act regulation. And so we are uh, in very good standing uh, to um, continue with the support for uh, the old Oakville Heritage Conservation District under the new legislative standards. So I've talked a little bit about engagement already, but I just wanted to highlight it again because it has been so integral to this process. Um, I, I thank the committee members and everybody for reading the document before you today, but I need to thank everybody who's participated in the process and has read numerous versions of the information that we've submitted. Uh, we've had those three public meetings where we have um, provided notice by email, by door, uh, Kirk and I had one lovely rainy afternoon where we delivered hand, uh, by hand uh, notices to everybody in the district about our public meetings. Um, this process really has developed an amazingly strong working relationship with the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association and the Oakville Historical Society, and we are so, uh, so pleased about that. We have offered one-on-one -on -one stakeholder sessions to the various institutions um, in the Heritage Conservation District, as well as organizations such as the uh, Residents Association. We've had two public online surveys, uh, numerous email updates, um, and numerous updates to both the town project webpage and the story maps webpage, which is run by our consultants and provides a much more interesting and kind of uh, visual representation of the process that we've been going through. And so I do want to put a special shout out to the Heritage Subcommittee of the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association 
uh, who are made up of members not just from the Residents Association, but also from the Oakville Historical Society, uh, representatives of St. Andrew's Church and St. Jude's Church, um, who have donated uh, so much of their time and effort, uh, it, especially in updating all of the, uh, working on all of the inventory sheets that you see in the package before you today. So the last thing I just want to close on, I think, for the review of the, the draft study before you is to note that it contains a very thorough policy review of uh, policies from both the provincial level, kind of going down to the nitty gritty uh, municipal tools that we have. Um, so, I mean, not looking just at the Ontario Heritage Act and Planning Act, um, as standards, but also what our livable Oakville plan and the regional official plan says, talking about the cultural heritage landscape strategy and the recognition of our individual cultural heritage landscapes, as well as recognition of this district, the Oak, uh, old Oakville Heritage Conservation District itself as a cultural heritage landscape. One of the big things that's come up during this process is a lot of feedback about zoning um, and the processes associated with zoning bylaw amendments, minor variances. And so we've been listening quite carefully so that we can um, bring that information over into the district plan and guidelines process, uh, but also to make sure that we're sharing that information with our colleagues who are undertaking the residential zoning bylaw review. The policy review also looks at uh, the implications of the site plan process, which has been changing under recent provincial legislation, adjacency under the provincial policy statement. We've looked at our existing heritage permit process and our process for delegated authority and how those things may be impacted in the future. And we've also looked at the town's property standards bylaw, the town's private tree protection bylaw, and we've made an awful lot of notes to carry forward about uh, residents' thoughts and concerns about future development for this area. And so I am happy to be here today uh, to uh, recommend that the draft study before you be endorsed. I am happy to answer any questions that anybody might have and to, uh, to of course, welcome ongoing political, or sorry, not political, but public <laughs> and political uh, discussion about, about this process because it is so important, both to members of the public our, and our local politicians and our heritage committee. So, um, yes, let, let me know what you'd like to talk about. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, Glad to hear you're backtracking from running for office anytime soon. <laughs> um, I think um, just before we have questions of you, we have to say that this, I know it's a big document. Yes. But my goodness, it's full of what I can see is going to be really useful and valuable information as we proceed with the job of developing the plan and guidelines. And as we begin to implement the new guidelines in the future, it'll be a great document to refer back to because it lists a lot of the heritage or lack of attributes for so many of the individual properties just in highlight form, but it gives us a clue and a guide as to why they appeared in one color on that map or another color on that map as adding to, we used to use the phrase contributing or non-contributing, I think. But there's so much in this that's so valuable and I know you've, you've, you've quite rightly and quite properly acknowledged the incredible help and support you've had, not just from your colleagues in the department, but from members of the community and all kinds of other people in this project. But we know that you've played a very significant role in, in this, Sue, and that you have, from the get-go, had the collaborative approach, which we all know, but often don't practice, we all know is the likely to produce the best outcome. So I want to thank you for all of that. Um, and to say that, uh, yes, it, this is a worthwhile endeavor so far. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Dunnick. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. And I echo those sentiments. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you've done on this, along with, as you pointed out, members of the public, the OLRA, 
Historical Society, all those uh, key, um, what shall I say, stakeholders who helped contribute to this fabulous document. The one question I have, um, towards the latter part of your presentation, you mentioned communicating with the zoning uh, staff or going through the zoning bylaw. <clears throat> Pardon me. The one thing I've heard for numerous years, and I thought this might give us a good opportunity to sort of fine tune, is the difference between, or the, um, what shall I say, disconnect between the Committee of Adjustment and our uh, heritage work. Is there any kind of work going towards, um, what shall I say, fine tuning that so as to have a clear parameter? I know you're guided by legislation, but I often find there's always one person who says, wait a minute, why are you going to Committee of Adjustment? Shouldn't you go to Heritage first? Was that looked at at all through this? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Um, zoning, as you know, is you know it's a bigger thing than just heritage, and there are a number, quite a number of considerations that factor into, especially variance applications. I would say that during this phase of the old Oakville update, we're mostly um, uh, interested in hearing and collecting people's information and experiences um, about uh, you know what has happened with. Uh, zoning so far and the changes that they've seen in their, uh, you know, in in the residential area over the past few years so that we can bring it forward into the district plan and guidelines. Because it really is the plan and guidelines that will set forward these tools that we can use for managing change. I think, um, you know, one of the most important things that the plan and guidelines can do is provide greater clarity um, to everybody involved in, um, you know, the, the process of, of changing properties in our Heritage Conservation District because, you know, the Heritage District is not a museum. Um, these processes that we're going through are not to freeze the district in time. They're about managing change in appropriate manners so that we can serve the things that we've identified as being important to us as a community. Um, Communication, as I mentioned, has been ongoing with the residential zoning bylaw review as it is a separate project and staff have been sharing that information with interested stakeholders such as the OLRA so that they can be jointly involved in both projects as they move forward because the residential zoning bylaw review is, you know, it's for a lot, far larger area than just old Oakville. But we recognize that this is an area that's been experiencing a lot of challenges, especially over recent years. And so in terms of process as to, who, you know, which goes first, I think that's uh, kind of a larger planning department issue, but what we can do through the district process is provide more clarity in our guidelines about which changes are acceptable and should be supported or not supported um, as applications come in for both variances and heritage permits, um, and those decisions are then made by uh, you know, the various kind of uh, authorities, whether it be the Director of Planning Services, the Committee of Adjustment, and Town Council. Thank you, I really appreciate that. So I think uh, sort of as a placeholder, then I'll be asking questions when the zoning bylaw comes forward and that may be the more appropriate place, but thank you. Yeah, that's right. Bob? Sue, so I, I, I would reiterate Drew and Kathy's congratulations on a, on a report well written. Uh, very understandable. <laughs> And I'm so pleased to see the increased reference to landscape and, and tree preservation. Um, in, the, in, the, in the next step, uh, I would hope that we would also work with the uh, tree protection bylaw um, to see whether there are special requirements in the heritage district, if, if, if that's possible within the law. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, definitely. Um, one of the things that I didn't really discuss actually is uh, our ongoing consultation with other town staff departments. And so, um, you know, something, uh, uh, 
Improving the protections in our private tree bylaw are certainly possible, um, and we would be working with town forestry staff to communicate the needs of this particular community, um, you know, special policy area, to see how those changes can be formalized through their legislative processes as, as well as ours. But really the first step, uh, like as you say, is to recognize the significance of, of natural heritage within the Heritage Conservation District, which, you know, I think the 1981 plan alluded to, but really uh, heritage at that time was very focused on built structures. And so, you know, it's it's not the fault of anyone. It was just uh, what was um, accepted as heritage conservation at that time. And I'd say that with our growing definitions and understandings of the importance of cultural heritage landscapes, you know, I try to picture old Oakville without its trees. I mean, it's a completely different place and that's not something that anyone wants to see. And so uh, we try to recognize in that and the study, the importance, and that will definitely be carried over into the uh, planning guidelines to have its own specific provisions as well as working with the town forestry department. Thank you. Yes, and as we all know to our cost, trees sometimes die. And it can be an expensive process to remove them. But if you did try to imagine old Oakville without these old trees, uh, so everything we do to protect and preserve those trees and to encourage the appropriate replanting when, when that is needed, uh, I think we should, we should be doing. Yeah, that's good. Okay, any other comments at this stage? No, thank you. So I know we have um, a registered delegation from the, uh, the um, OLRA Heritage Working Group, and we have in fact two delegates who have told me that they're going to do a double act and uh, sort of forgo the opportunity to have 20 minutes and not just 10. <laughs> um, and, and we appreciate that. And uh, just to remind the committee, you, you did get sent to you electronically uh, the submission uh, from this heritage group, uh, which I think was a very clear and well-documented submission. And, and now I think the two ladies uh, who will give their name, rank and serial number to the secretary, we know who you are, but she's got to do this formally. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, committee members, Mr. Chairman and the others. Uh, my name's Anita Mackey, and I'm the uh, board member of the Oaks, Oakville Lakeside Residents Association and current chair of the subcommittee working group that was struck to support the public input into the new draft guideline study and plan. Okay. And my colleague is Jane Hockrig, who sits on the working group with us, former past chair of the OLRA, but came back to specifically support the important work of the subcommittee on the heritage um, so you do have our report, um, and I do want to actually, it's a mutual admiration society with Sue because I had already planned to give her a, a shout out on the wonderful, excellent collaboration process that we have had with Sue um, and the other stakeholders, and everybody cares to get this right and to take the time to do it right, and there's been an awful lot of work and effort and volunteer time and the town has been very supportive and open to our comments and took tons of time to sit down with us and go through those inventory sheets week after week and go through them with, with others. And I think we are close to an, a really good work product and we're pleased at the progress. So I think my remarks will be sort of on overall observations, what we think is wonderful in it and got right. And there's a few areas that we still think need a little bit more work and we've got some more input and then how we think maybe your recommendation might be tweaked a little bit as to the next steps. So our overall observations are we're really pleased with the progress and this draft is, is a huge improvement over the first draft. Uh, we're happy to see the recognition of the cultural heritage landscape attributes of the district. Uh, we want a little more clarity on whether there'll be a separate designation or is it just going to be emphasized within the heritage designation itself, but the recognition of the more heritage landscape is very important. Uh, the work on the inventories, this is the bedrock of the foundation of what will be the guidelines because you don't, you don't know how to protect something if you don't know what you're protecting. So that's going to inform all of those attributes that we want to protect and then how are we going to protect them. 
Uh, the importance of the zoning impact, we are very pleased to see recommendations on changes that might be needed to the zoning, especially on the impact of height setbacks and massing and some examples of development that really might have been improved um, and has had a bit of a detrimental impact on the district. We also are very happy to see the recommendation for an adjacency buffer, and we'd like to see that brought forward as well in the zoning and planning stages that come next. So the areas that we think need some further work, um, some of the historical settlement descriptions uh, we think need to be enhanced a little bit better to reflect the historical activity, especially in the industries that helped found the town and the harbor. One particular example of that is there was a very significant shipbuilding activity in the harbor, and that's really not called out in there. We've given some more sources and a submission to the town to try to build that part up. It does talk about the yacht building, but that was pleasure craft that came later. There was a commercial shipbuilding. The founder, Mr. Chisholm himself, created that, and some of the very significant captains whose houses you'll see with their names on it, and shipbuilders and ship carpenters, there were cottages all over this district that had workers in that industry. So we think that should be emphasized more. Um, the landmarks um, that are identified in the 1982 plan, there were some public-private buildings that were noted. In this study, not all of those were brought forward. I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague Jane to talk a little bit more about our approach on landmarks that we wanna have some further dialogue on. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so in, in the 1982 plan, um, as part of almost the, what, what Sue's now referring to as the streetscape analysis and character areas, there was reference to key buildings that actually um, add to the streetscape impact of the different blocks. As we move towards a smaller number of areas, so go from 17 to five or six or whatever we'll end up land, landing on, we think it's still particularly important because those key buildings are still in place and they still, most of them are there in their original form. And so they had a role to play in 82. We think and uh, would argue that they have um, a, a similar role to play in this plan going forward. And so we wanna ha engage in that conversation with the staff further as we talk more about the character areas. Should I move on to that then? Yeah. <clears throat> and so, um, in a, in a way, the streetscape areas are actually, I think, what pull all together what this cultural heritage landscape is about. We, inve we have invested a lot of time, as, as Anita mentioned, in terms of the, bu the built inventory. Um, but what makes the old Oakfield district really important is actually how those elements kind of come together. And interestingly enough, you know, when we talked to the consultants about a year ago, they noted that very few plans had block analysis. And so in some ways, when we, we could maybe be proud that um, the Oakville um, plan identified those. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that the, the rigor of what was captured in those blocks comes forward in with whatever the final boundaries of the character areas are. Um, we, uh, it was our understanding that we would have time to further review that before it got sort of blessed in stone. And, and from conversations with Sue, I think we still have that opportunity. We have put forward um, some alternative boundary areas that we think perhaps better capture the streetscape. We're not trying to go back to 17. I think we've actually got five or six thoughts and concepts of what they could be. We did not put that in our package with you because we didn't feel we'd had appropriate conversations with town staff and the consultants to, to sort of make a vigorous case for it. Um, but when we think about streetscape character, it's not just the landscape. And one of the things that we found in doing this is, is that the grid pattern, which has established the Oakville plan and the street pattern that we see today, is actually um, one of the key factors that helped Lunenburg be recognized as a World Heritage Site. And there are very few examples of that grid pattern still in place in Canada. And so we have a very unique element there that over time, that pattern and its development over time created an opportunity. And so when we see the setbacks, how the built form 
ties in with topography and landscaping, we think that there are some opportunities to adjust what's being put forward in this plan so far to make it even better and have sort of then ensuring that any attributes that we want to capture are actually really reflective of that. And so um, we have proposed some, some thoughts. You'll see there's not many more colors. <laughs> there's five or six of them, but we do believe based upon our understanding of the area that some conversation will make it much more meaningful in terms of landing on something. Thanks, Jane. Um, the other area that we think ha it's part of the strength of the new draft, but I think we could be brought forward, and uh, Councillor Lachlan mentioned it, um, the tree canopy has been identified as a key characteristic of this cultural heritage landscape. And it is being lost due to aging out of trees, disease, um, and we have actually lost some really big trees this year, a uh, significant number. And so we thought it would be good if the plan could recommend a strategy for the town to and to allocate actual budget as to how we're going to build up that canopy. Because as you know, plant a tree now, it's going to take 100 years for that to replace what's already there. So it has to be started now. And even just the public trees we're talking about, not just private. Um, they obviously work together, but we've lost a lot of the public trees along the, the avenues recently. Um, as can be expected in any draft, there were some editing comments and we've given a full sort of uh, uh, markup of areas that we think were inconsistent or needed some clarification or some errors. There's a few things on that lovely map that showed the uh, er eras of the buildings and when they were built and there's a couple that should have been in purple and they were in blue and, but those kinds of things that we can fix up. So um, we've got a great dialogue with Sue and uh, I know she's got a million edits herself. So we will just work together to make sure we get that all right. So recommended next steps. What, what we'd like to see is that you got, you, the council the Heritage Committee is being asked to endorse the study at this phase, um, but we would like to suggest maybe a tweak that this is an opportunity to use the next four to six weeks to run a parallel process. We don't want to slow anything down, but we want to get it right. And I think we can all multitask. We've got uh, hands and we're willing to help. So I think we can continue to work on the study. People are starting to comment on their own properties in the inventory and there's some tweaking there to do. I think most of the work is done on that already. In the study itself, we've got some comments. And uh, in the meantime, we can be working on the guidelines, which is the next stage, start meeting with the town and the consultants on those guidelines. That's the next stage and the study's the foundation for it. We also wanna recommend that we get budget, if the town could get budget, to just finish off the study. I don't think it'll take a lot more, but let's finish it and get it right. If that could be a recommendation to council, I guess is where that needs to go. Um, so again, just reiterate, the study is really important to the foundation of getting the plan and the guidelines right. Thank you. You folks should think about doing this for a living. You're bang on your 10 minutes. <laughs> Talk fast. So, Thank you very much. Before you before you uh, before you go, there might be some some questions, and uh, um, I, I might make a, a, a comment though, and maybe ask Sue for a minute because I think there are some things, and I know that Carolyn has been very much involved in this process um, with, with 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 the writing and the structure and you know the creation of, of some of the the words in here um, that some of the historical part that you're referring to that you'd like to strengthen in here to make this you know an even better document i think that's something that that we could do that's something that staff would be responsive to and any of the any of the corrections of you know any spelling or colors or stuff that we obviously we would deal with that but that's good input another pair of eyes is always good and the last pair of eyes will always see something that you missed um so is that fair to say that you could you could push in a lot of that good stuff uh, from the, at the staff level. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, yeah, sorry, one thing that I should have mentioned earlier is that um, we know that we need some time to tidy up. Um, this is a draft study, um, and we knew that we would be having more public consultation and information um, received at this meeting today, and so this item actually isn't on the September 11th Planning and Development Council meeting. 
it is um, being held to be brought forward probably um, either at the next one, sometime in October, so that we can um, have the time to make the, the corrections. I think, um, uh, you know, the additional information about shipbuilding history can be quite easily uh, addressed. We're very open to, in, you know, adjusting the history section. Um, and, and certainly, as uh, Jane and Anita have noted, you know, my version's got a bunch of changes too. I've got <laughs> sticky notes everywhere. And those are, those are definitely things that need to be tidied up. Um, the one thing um, that I would very briefly touch on uh, that was alluded to um, is uh, our budget situation. Um, and so just to make it clear to the committee, um, uh, the RFP that we put out um, for the project uh, had a relatively low budget, and we determined that it wasn't going to be um, enough to uh, get the work done with the amount of engagement that we needed. And so uh, we went back and actually um, did an additional budget request through our purchasing department to um, up the funds for this project in order to get the engagement done uh, kind of once we were in the process and, and learning more about what the community wanted and what we needed to respond to. We've also had, since then, an, an additional budget um, increase kind of develop, dealt with at the uh, department level. And so right now, um, we, have, uh, ex we have used and exceeded our budget for the study portion of this project. And so that's why um, should, uh, should the committee, should council, uh, you know, uh, want us to take the extra time to work with the community, which myself and our consultant teams are, are very willing to do. Um, it's just uh, uh, we lack the budget in order to uh, involve our consultants in that process, which is a very important um, thing. So that is just an explanation as to uh, that particular reference for the committee's information. Okay, good. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Duddick. Thank you. Um, first, thank you very much for your delegation. Very, very insightful and very helpful sort of putting the last pieces of the puzzle together. Um, through, and I wonder if I could ask Sue, um, given the importance of this area, as you say, it's the oldest, um, and I can certainly understand the constraints, financial, you guys have gone above and beyond, and understandably so. How can we on council, Councillor Giddings and myself, assist to, do you need some sort of a motion or can we work offline with you in regards to making that happen given that you've already got a placeholder of October possibly for this to come forward? Um, and do you have a ballpark figure that might uh, incorporate that ask? Mr. Chair, do you, do you want to deal with that or do you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, could we just hold it there? Because it's, it's astonishing, and I'll share with you how astonishing this all is. Um, but if we could just hold that, um, Councillor Dunnock, and, and it's not going to go away. It, it's not going to go away. We'll hold that. Um, any other questions of the delegation? Councillor. Councillor Gittings. Uh, thank you, through you, uh, Chair. Uh, thanks for coming out. Thanks for your countless hours uh, between yourselves and, and the rest of the community. It's uh, another example of incredible engagement from the area. Uh, I appreciated the comments about the trees. Uh, I have received a number of calls when the dreaded Red X appeared at 14 Navy, uh, the two trees on town property. Yeah. And the number of uh, the comments being why are they being removed? Is it the homeowners, the town? And uh, I took some pictures and showed the rot that was there and that they were a public safety hazard. And so uh, we love our trees. I take your comments very seriously and uh, we'll be following up on that. Just wanted to let you know that people from outside of the area uh, reached out to me, dug, me, dug out my contact details to to express their concerns. So thanks for mentioning that. I think just for clarification, which interesting is that um, the tree mapping, which is in the study, 
Um, if you look at it closely, it's identified as residential trees, but they're actually, most of them are on town property. And like, for example, I have five mature trees on our property, but it, they're technically town trees because they're on the town perimeter. And so that's, I think, why we're raising the point around understanding that there's budget implications here for not just taking the tree down and planting one, but the ongoing maintenance of them. Um, I will share that personally, Jamie and I used to pay for our trees to be fertilized, our town trees to be fertilized and done every two years. And then it was suggested that we didn't need to do that, but it hasn't been done since. So it is, it is an issue um, for us. Thank you very much uh, for your delegation then. If there are no other questions, really appreciate that. Um, so, this is, is really interesting, and, and we're going to talk about it ourselves, but obviously um, the Vice Chair and I prepared for a meeting, and uh, we did get the benefit of the, the, the study, the report, the work uh, that the uh, OLRA had done. So we'd read that, and we could see the points it seemed to be raising, and we could see the direction it could be going. And we had our meeting with the staff, too, yesterday, uh, on Zoom, and where where we kind of got to, and sort of where my head is at now, and I, I know it's it's the vice chair where her head is at too, is that first of all, this is an excellent report. I didn't ask, but we, it was volunteered that this is a good report. This this is seen as a really valuable document, so it's probably got a nine out of ten. But we know there's some further work that needs to be done to make it as good as it can be. And it needs to be as good as it can be because this is a very important project uh, to get our new guidelines in place. So the first thing where my head's at is that we, we should endorse this. We should tell council we endorse this report. But there's more work to be done. We cannot provide the budget. Uh, staff have already moved the coffee fund and the postage fund and a few other funds around and have, have done more work, but we're, we're, we're away from that. So we have to ask council to provide that additional money to deal, I think specifically, because we don't want it to be too open-ended when you're dealing with consultants and you don't want to be too open-ended in terms of time either, but to focus on the character areas. And I think that's really what I'm getting from the, the submission, is that the character areas need a bit more work. You can approach it with an historical viewpoint or a landscape viewpoint, a mix of both. They can be straight lines. They can be a bit fuzzy at the edges in places. There's a few things that you can do with it. That would be a worthwhile activity, and we should ask council to endorse that. At the same time, none of us wants any delay. This is an important project. Every one of us here knows how hard it is to evaluate a heritage application here dealing with the current guidelines. Because they're 40 years old. They were good, they were the best of their kind. But they're 40 years old and that's why the study's in place. So the sooner we get new guidelines in place, the better. So we don't want to slow anything down. So what I had done is I'd shared these thoughts with staff and Sue kind of typed it up for me um, so that I've got it here and is, is just just sort of where I'm at, and that's, you're making the chair work today because that's what chairs are supposed to do, I guess, but to just try and get the sense of where we're going. And I would say that the motion might be that the report entitled Old Oakville Heritage Conservation District Update, Heritage Conservation District Study dated August 23 be endorsed, subject to A, council consideration of additional budget to provide for more engagement with stakeholders, regarding the landscape character areas in the district study. And that the work proceeds on the new plan and guidelines forthwith. Because there's nothing stopping us beginning the process of structuring uh, the consultations that will have to take place to develop the new plan. By the time we get to the really important stuff of writing up the words in these guidelines, this study will have been endorsed and accepted by everybody. So that's 
kind of where I'm at. I could share that. The, the vice chair had a copy. Councillor Gittings wanted a copy. Um, but that's kind of, and, and Sue, I'm sure, has got a copy of what she gave me. But that's kind of where I'm at. So if I'm reading what I'm hearing right, and I'm reading what I'm hearing from the committee right, then that, I think, would be a good outcome. It's collaborative. It's getting the input and not ignoring input. It's getting and recognizing the value of that input. So that, that's me. Any, any comments or discussion? Uh, Kathy? Jerry? Jerry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That, um, I think you've captured it excellently. That pretty much sums up, um, I think, and very well said. I have, um, if I may, I have two comments, well, a couple of comments to make. One is um, that within the study, the maps, as uh, Sue said, uh, um, a diagram, a photo is worth a thousand words, and they are absolutely fantastic and wonderful. Uh, my comment would be, can they be bigger? Because as I was reading through the report, uh, some of the maps, it was very difficult to um, to actually make, uh, to, to see what the uh, analysis was indicating because they were too small to really get the full benefit of all the work that goes into these maps. So that would be my one comment. Um, the, the second comment is based on the delegation's uh, really um, important view of the previous block analysis. Can the block analysis of the previous study be attached to the recent to the new study as an appendix? Um, if it doesn't have any conflicts with the new study, can it be looked at and integrated as an appendix? And then the final thing I have to say is uh, we are so grateful to have such a, a passionate and public and capable uh, public engagement on this. So thank you so much for, for all the hard work that you've done to support and work with uh, Sue and our consultants and, and us here. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jerry. Councillor Giddings? Yeah, thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, I saw some nodding heads uh, on this side of, uh, of the chambers. And so I think that uh, I take from the number of nods that uh, your comments were well received. Just wondering, did you, we have it type written up here. Did you want that, the clerk to place that so you can have a look at it? Or you're, are you fine with that? I could hear it, so I think we're fine. I think we trust you. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, well, uh, just wanted to see your thoughts first. And Chair, I appreciated your comments in terms of uh, the last plan standing up fairly well for four decades. And uh, I'm sure the Councillor Duddock will agree with me in terms of uh, if this work is going to continue for four decades as well, uh, I think we'd like to see us work on bringing that budget increase forward. Uh, we have a budget meeting starting off next week, I believe. And so, um, you got a couple of supporters here. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, since we're restricted to the board, I, I'd like to really say how encouraged I am by the results of this study and also the, um, the participation by the Lakeside residents and all the stakeholders involved. It's, just, it, it's interesting how you sit here now, go back 40 years and and that's right, the interesting time we had in, in putting together the first plan because we had to get all the support of the residents, just residents in those days, and council. And the difficulty was that the planning staff in, was, in, uh, was uh, made up of three people, David Nelson, uh, Bo Angevair, and I forget Audrey's last name, and they weren't, they weren't heritage planners. They were forced into that. Not maybe not forced, but suggested they volunteered. <laughs> volunteered. That's right. Into it, and they did a fantastic job. But that brings me just up now to the block by block analysis. And the reason that was done on that basis is that if you walk through the area, you will notice that almost every block is unique. It's quite different from the next block. 
not only in, in the topography, the, the landscape, the houses, the setbacks, everything is quite different. And that's why the block by block was used. And I think it's quite helpful. And I, I agree that if they could encourage that or, or to slide that in as well with the, with the overall analysis of the six blocks, that, that, that would, I think, be quite helpful. But I'm, uh, I'm very encouraged. But of course, the proof's always in the pudding. And we'll see what the actual uh, plan uh, comprises and, the, and the, uh, the difficulties that we incur and have encountered and continue to encounter with the zoning regulations. And that's the, that's the thing that's bothered me for a number of years. But uh, the, here's the opportunity, perhaps, to, uh, to change that. So there should, there should be a specific zoning for that area, because it's quite a unique and different area. It's quite different from First and Second Street and, and the, uh, and the uh, Trafalgar Reynolds districts. So um, that, by short, <laughs> my, I'm off, right on my 10 minutes, but thank you uh, for that. But that's, I, I, I'm really encouraged by the, uh, by the risk, the response we've had. Thank you. Thanks, George. Now I can see Brenda, I've been able to see Brenda throughout the meeting, and I know that Jason's still there. Brenda, did you want to say anything at this point? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I have to say, I think everybody has spoken extremely eloquently on the topic, and I support everything that's been said on this. Um, I agree that, especially with the recommendation to look at green space and uh, maintaining the canopy, um, we know that pressures with climate change, with the type of trees that are currently planted uh, in, in the neighborhood, in that conservation district, that they're going to be under increasing in future pressure. So I think it's important to have that as a priority, and, and I welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. And, and Jason, were you uh, wanting to speak? No, I guess not. Okay. Um, so I, I'll, I'll read it again. Um, and it, this, <laughs> as everybody can attest, this was drafted yesterday. <laughs> um, but the minds seem to all be in the same place, so it's really it's really good to see that. Anyway, that the motion would be that the report entitled "Old Oakville Heritage Conservation District Update Heritage Conservation District Study, dated August 2023, be endorsed, subject to Council's consideration of additional budget to provide for more engagement with stakeholders." regarding the landscape character areas in the district study and that work proceeds on the new plan and guidelines forthwith. Is somebody prepared to give me that motion? Councillor Gittings has given me that motion. Is there any discussion on that motion? Is there anyone opposed to that motion? Seeing none, the motion is carried. Now, I heard that it's not going on September the 11th, which had been my assumption, but I assume that won't really materially slow things down. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. So that's wonderful. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for your uh, active participation in this, and again, to our, our delegations and to staff who've supported this. Okay, our next item is item five, which is the report on the Heritage Conservation District update. I think we've kind of had that. <laughs> no further information, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the latest information is that we have passed the motion to find the money to continue the study, so that's good. Okay, the date and time of our next meeting is September the 19th, uh, which will be here and at 9.30. We need a motion to adjourn, and I think Brenda's just anxious to give us that motion because she's in Finland, and it's now, I guess, about five o'clock there or something, or six o'clock, six o'clock, actually. <laughs> so she's, she'd be, she's ready for her, um, her, her cocktail, I guess. <laughs> Mr. Chair, that would mean the two meetings back to back. Yeah, two meetings back to back. Okay, that's a pity. August. Okay, so <laughs> that, that motion will have no opposition, so I declare our meeting closed. Thank you again, everybody, for the gift of your time. It is greatly appreciated. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>